Hi everyone. Welcome to the Wheeler Centre for a conversation about children and leadership as part of the Wheeler Education Program series. Today we're going to be speaking to Dr. Claudia Escobar Vega, a leadership cognition and child development expert. My name is Robin Gowenda and I'm going to be your host. But before we begin, I'd like to invite all of you tuning in to take a deep breath and ground your feet for a moment of reflection as we acknowledge country. I would like to acknowledge that Claudia and I are tuning in from the ceded, unceded sovereign lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and pay my deep respects to elders past, present and future. I'd also like to extend my respects to the elders of the country that you're tuning in from. Um, in my day job, I'm the Executive Director of Footscray Community Arts Centre and we're really privileged to have two elders in residence now we Dr. Carolyn Briggs and Uncle Larry Walsh. Something that Uncle Larry likes to say in his acknowledgements to country is that all communities have elders, people that we look up to, people that care for us, that give us advice and support us. Um, and in that spirit, I'd like to also extend my respect to co uh, community leaders and elders in your communities too. And I think that's a really beautiful way and a really respectful way to talk about leadership, which is what we're here to do today. Before we jump into our conversation that's going to explore Claudia's Australian first research, I would like to formally introduce Claudia to you. Dr. Claudia Escobar Vega has a PhD in leadership cognition and child development and currently works as a research fellow and casual academic at Deakin University Business School. Claudia's areas of research include leadership cognition, implicit leadership theory, child development and socially constructed theories of leadership. She's worked for over 20 years consulting and developing projects in collaboration with children and young people from diverse backgrounds and in diverse settings. And personally, I think it's such a privilege to sit next to you and share this stage because I've known Claudia for about a decade. And actually, Claudia was the first person that gave me a gig in the art sector in Melbourne. So I have to blame you for that. Thanks very much. <laughs> Um, but importantly, I want to say on a personal level that Claudia is a brilliant mind, a you know, person with incredible generosity of spirit and is an amazing academic and also a creative and theatre maker, which is really exciting because I think the arts are a really important part of this conversation. So today we're going to talk about how lead, uh, children perceive leadership and what we can also do as leaders and community members to harness this research positively and shape future leadership that we're really proud and happy with. Um, and I'm going to do some good housekeeping. So if you come up with any questions during the conversation today, please share them in the comments section on the live stream and we'll get to them at the end. So Claudia, I think we should start um, this conversation by asking the audience a question. Thank you, Robin. And hello, everyone streaming from your homes, your workplaces, from other parts of the world, hopefully. <laughs> Um, first of all, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of the Kulin Nation from where this conversation is taking place. And I want to recognize their connection to land, water and culture. I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I also would like to acknowledge the future generations of this world and recognize the responsibility I have to ensure that their needs and interests are safely guarded. Um, this is inspired by the UNESCO's declaration on the responsibilities of the present generations towards future generations. So thank you, Robin. And before I continue, I think um, you should blame me, but lots of people are going to be so happy that you got the first arts gig because you do an incredible work at the Food Street Community Arts Center. And also before that, in all the amazing projects that you have been involved since we met back then, 10 years ago. <laughs> so yeah, it's a privilege to be sitting next to you. And I'm really happy that we have reconnected through this uh, conversation of children and leadership. And I've experienced really great um, moments with you putting this talk together. So thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, so yes, back to the question to the audience. Um, so if you could all just take a breath, 
and try to close your eyes wherever you are and try to picture in your mind a leader, a leader leading. What comes to mind? Would you say, is it a person? Is it a man? Is it a woman? What are they doing? Robin, how is that, that for you? What did you think of? It's actually a harder question than I thought it would be. Obviously, my first answer would be kind of a red-headed, amazing woman <laughs> like on the top of a mountain. <laughs> um, but actually, you know, I think when I think about a lead off, I actually think of artists kind of holding space for people mm. to create together because I think there's something really powerful in that action. So I think that's what I'm going to go with in my oh, answer. That's a really interesting. So not an individual, but a collective. Yeah. It's very um, great. So, yeah, when we think about what a leader is for us, where do you think this idea came from? What, what do you think you... When in your life did you first sort of start thinking about leaders? That's a really good question. I guess I would say probably my teachers at school, or my parents, or maybe my big brother. He was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, so that connects to what we're going to be discussing today. So we all have an idea of a leader. And this video is going to show us fairly ideas of leaders. A leader is someone that, like telling some people what to do, but like nicely, like with please and thank you, or like please will, please, because that's a nice word. If they just say like shouting a little bit, like come on, do this, um, it won't really work. So um, a leader is like someone that's nice, that's telling someone what to do and the others follow them. Them. It can be a girl, boy, parent, um, mum, dad, daughter. Um, it can be a kid too. Right, so as we can see, um, from a very early age, we have ideas of what a leader is. And there we can see um, how we start to define what a leader is for us when we're very, very young. These uh, theories of leaders um, are called implicit leadership theories, and that's the focus of the theory. The implicit leadership theories, or ILTs, are looking at how we perceive leaders, what are our, are our expectations, and how do we give someone the status of a leader. So these are basically when you encounter a potential leader or a person, you have implicit ideas that have been developing throughout your experiences with leaders. And then uh, when you meet someone, then you perceive, and these implicit leadership theories or ILTs help you to work out whether this person fits within your idea of leader or if not. So they are really, really important because um, basically, they guide who is going to be recognized as a leader and who won't. And when you look at these phenomena in groups, implicit leadership theories are influenced within groups. So it doesn't really work for your own point of view, but it sort of needs to align with the others that are working alongside you to actually give the leadership status to another person. So this theory has been studied for over 40 years and mostly in adults, um, looking at what are we looking in, in leaders and what characteristics are really common across cultures or what characteristics are common across different work environments or, uh, or even uh, before um, we start to work in, in our lives but never in the early years of life. So um, it is really passionate for me because uh, it is so important to understand these items. And then where do they come from? How do they appear? How do they develop? So that's basically the focus of the research that I conducted. 
It's such an interesting idea and and I think as you get older and you enter your professional life, you hear the word leadership a lot, but I don't think we talk about it um, very much with kids, like as part of them growing up. And this quote really, really struck me when I, you know, first engaged with your research about five-year-old children already have a concept of a leader and can distinguish between leaders and non-leaders. Five years old seems really young to me and I was trying to think what did I think when I was five but it was unfortunately so long ago I can't <laughs> piece that back together um, but I think it's it's a really interesting concept so can you talk us through the methodology of the research yeah sure so um, the five-year-old children has been found across different countries and um, it is suspected that it may very well happen even before. So uh, research is still to be done in uh, in kinder and even three-year-old kinder settings. But yeah, we know that by five-year-old, most of the children have a concept. Um, the research that I conducted, um, I engaged with it in 2017. And I was looking at the question, how do children define a leader? And how do these ideas or these definitions develop across primary school? So from when they are five years old up until when they are 12. Um, so I did this research in a, in a school in the northern, northern suburbs of Melbourne, a public school. And all the children in the school, uh, approximately 550 were invited, but uh, we got response for 251, which is still really good for That's a, a lot of kids. Yeah, for a good, it's a good, a really good sample. And the way that the research was conducted was, um, so in alliance with the art teachers, we developed an, an art uh, lesson plan where we asked the children to draw a leader leading, and that was the, the focus of the class. They were encouraged to do their own drawing. Um, I explained that this was because we were interested in learning more about that, what they had to say about leaders, that all ideas were welcome. It wasn't about doing a great, perfect drawing for those that don't really feel like they're good at drawing, though I think all of them are amazing. And yeah, so we gave them a lot of confidence about it and and then reminded them of the importance of giving their own idea, trying to minimize any copying or mm. anything like that. Um, so that was the art class and, and they responded really well. Um, at the beginning, th some of them were like, what? Draw a leader leading? What? What? What are you talking about? It's like, no, you can take the time to reflect, think. You don't need to start straight away. It's good. It's okay. And part of that exercise was doing the drawing, but also speaking to the drawing, wasn't it? Right. So after we collected all the drawings for the kids that had provided consent, then I met with each of them separately. So 251 children. And then I asked them to describe the drawing to me. And, and then I asked them a lot of questions about the drawing because I didn't want to make any kind of assumptions of what a dot or a color in the skin or, I don't know, a, a line meant. So, so they, and then after the narrative of the drawing, then I asked them a few questions about what is a leader, uh, how does a leader become a leader, a person become a leader, what's a good leader, a bad leader, and um, if they wanted to, if they thought a um, particular leader was good, the name of a person. Yeah, so here's an example of a girl um, describing her drawing to me, so you get a better idea of what the narrative component of the research was like. So... The first question is, if you can please describe your drawing to me. Um, well, a teacher, and I think teachers are really good leaders, um, is teaching a little girl how to throw a spear, and they're like warriors sort of thing. How come you sort of portrayed a leader as a warrior? Uh, just because um, leaders are very like, they're sort of... 
they're very outgoing and ambitious. Mm-hmm. And so is she um, like an adult? Yeah, she's Yeah, right. and that's a little girl. And did you get inspiration from any kind? Because it looks so fantastic. Uh, did you get inspiration from a particular book or any kind of... No. no? It's all from your mind? Yeah. It's beautiful. So are you interested in like uh, tribal sort yeah. of? Yeah. Oh, cool. And what's this bit here? It's a snake. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because they're in like sort of like a forest sort of setting and a lot of animals would be living there too. Yeah. But is it dangerous, a snake? or? I'm not really sure. Yeah, no. <laughs> I yeah, so that's just an excerpt, but usually in average, um, the the narratives are about ten minutes per drawing. So wow, there's um, a lot I, behind the drawings. I'm really um, admiring your commitment to <laughs> that. I mean, but how exciting too, because they've they've created a world around these leaders that they they're imagining, haven't they? Yeah, and you really can't just use a drawing to think that you can understand what a child thinks. Um, you really have to let them complement the drawing with their own narrative. And many of the times the drawing is only half of the story or even less. Mm. So after that, well, all that data was coded using a coding manual where I collaborated with Professor Susan Wright from Melbourne Uni, who's an expert in, in children's drawings and narratives. and and then we could mm, measure and identify uh, dimensions and, and, and role models and other characteristics in terms of behavior, um, appearance, and personality of the leaders that the children had uh, depicted. So we can jump into the results. <laughs> All right, so what we found is that, and this is also informed by the literature that has been developed about children's thinking of leaders since the 40s, um, that children's ideas of leaders can be um, seen from it's a physical, spatial point of view, socio-emotional, humanitarian, or functional. And I'm going to explain what are each of those with some examples, but here, the level of sophistication of how a child can see leadership would depend on how many of these dimensions are they able to combine in their, in their explanations. So the physical spatial, spatial temporal dimension is that basically the leader is uh, the one in front or the one that is the biggest or the fastest or the one that wears the biggest hat. So all these observable features of the leader are what's the first thing that they engage with. After that, it's functional. It's like, what is the leader there to do? So it tells me what to do, makes decisions, um, gets the task done, uh, takes me to the park, <laughs> buys me an ice cream, you know? Um, so the leader achieves the goal that they want, they, they want to pursue. Then there's the socio-emotional dimension, and it's basically how the leader makes others feel. How do they interact with others on an emotional level? Is the leader kind? Is the leader nice? Is the leader mean? Um, does the leader help others? Or So all these aspects about um, the relationship between the leader and the follower. And then there's the humanitarian dimension, which is, um, what the leader can do about uh, society, what influence or what impact, good or bad, the leader may have over our society's well-being. So the critical thinking about what leaders can or should or wouldn't or we want or they should do is comes here. Um, so some of the key findings is that Age groups have similar ideas, and I will explain, uh, but there are exceptions. There are children that are really out of the trend from the age, age group. And these exceptions are because of children's experiences with leaders or as leaders, or also because they've had family conversations about leaders or because they are exposed to media environment. 
um, there is the think leader, think adult uh, bias that I call, which is uh, most of the children think a leader is an adult. Mm. The, the youngest children in prep are interested in, it, it, they portray themselves as leaders more than any other group. So then they reach grade one, and it's all basically adults most of the time. So shouldn't we nurture that sense of leadership mm, that they seem to have at the beginning? We're being told something there, aren't we? Yeah. When that shift is happening so young too. Yeah, yep. so that's uh, another finding. Um, gender biases change over time. So um, back in the 80s in the, in the US, mo the girls mostly drew male leaders. And that changed to in the late 90s to 70% of the times the girls drawing female leaders. The boys everywhere always usually draw male leaders 98% um, of the times or even 100% of the times in other studies. I think we might be seeing that play out in later in life if we kind of look at cabinet in, in our the, politics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Here in Australia, in my study, in average, 70% um, of the girls drew a female leader and 30% didn't. Boys, 98% of the time, thanks to the queen. <laughs> so <laughs> the only boys that drew a female leader uh, in 2018 were um, drew the queen. Um, but what's happening is that when I measure the girls uh, in grade six, this percentage went down to 40%. So only 40% of the girls drew a female leader, and then the 60% drew a male leader. Um, and we can expand on that farther down the road when we're talking about age groups. But um, the other important finding is that we I found the faceless woman. The faceless woman are these drawings of women who are usually political leaders or leaders um, in the, towards the future, and they don't have eyes, they don't have a nose, they don't have a mouth. They are faceless, and you can see in the slide mm, an example of two of those. Um, why? We can talk about that later on. <laughs> um, there was only one reference to a First Nations leader, and it was a generic. A leader, so no specific role model. And this is something that we should be reflecting upon because mm. we talk about First Nations, we acknowledge country, but children don't have a connection to the leadership um, in First Nations, and they, they should. And this is something that we need to act upon. And lastly, it's not a game. So children are not drawing the, the leader of their game in the playground, it's reality. Mm. They're drawing their ideas about leaders in the real world and sometimes about how imaginary, uh, but quite realistic about how they would hope a leader to think or to act. I'm gonna do show you an example of that. This is a drawing by a boy in grade three, nine years, three months, and he says, well, there's 10 million people gathered up in this circle, so down in the right corner. Um, then they're asking question and questions, and he's making improvements because of what they're asking. Make it rain for the farmers if possible. He said, okay, why can't we get guns so easily? I will also stop making guns so accessible in America. I will give $1 million to charity to cure cancer, stop homelessness, child slavery, and hire people who want to work. And also stop killing animals for meat and instead growing lab meat. So this leader has a question mark in the face too because they don't know this leader, but it's what the, the boy would like a leader to be. There's something really comforting that aspiration is part of how children are thinking about leadership. Because I think when maybe when we get adults, the reality of society and, and the leaders that we have in place, feels like the hope kind of disappears a little bit and there's a bit of acceptance of leadership that maybe isn't reflective of what we think and want. That's right. And that's why there's a moment 
along this road where where we lose that sort of connection and awareness mm. that leadership is a social resource and it's there for us to take us where we want to go. But it's sort of, we sort of disconnect in some ways and then we just sort of complain about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, how are we doing with time, I wonder? I think we might need to shuffle a little bit through up. this. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so I'm just going to give some um, just little findings of each uh, group just in case some of the people observing today are interested in how they differentiate. So these are the trends that we found. In PrEP, um, children have the most positive views of leaders. Most All of the leaders have um, leaves upwards, a smiley face. Um, the children recognize themselves as leaders, as I said. And it's also usually the line leader or any or stuff like that. All right. In early primary school, in grade one and two, they start to um, expand their minds, I guess, and absorb more information. And the ideas become more functional. So the leader gives me information or tells me where to go or knows things. And that's very, very relevant in this age. But there's also an increased um, level of content in, in more like violence and more leaders with lips straight. Um, there's a combination of imagination with reality. So some of that violence comes from uh, dinosaurs or monsters or, or uh, ninjas. Well, some of the of of it also may come from the political sphere. Back then, uh, Donald Trump was meeting with Kim Jong Un, and they were talking about missiles. So the, this sort of um, news and information is being reflected upon this group, even as er as early as in grade one or wow. grade two. Um, then in middle primary school is like a moment of a perceptual expansion or explosion. Uh, this group shows the majority of contexts where they gather ideas from leaders and also of role models. Like they just talk about entertainment, uh, book, uh, uh, internet characters, uh, movie characters, but also talk about uh, politicians. They also talk about sports. Uh, uh, Rolando, they also talk about um, teachers, so it's a big combination. It's like they are like in a perceptual sort of moment where they are uh, allowing anything that's out there to provide the insights into this. Here, um, they start to draw the leaders with their lips downwards and also increased levels of violence um, more specifically from the boys, and the question here is, you had the question for this. Yeah, I think this was, I actually saw a lot of these images. So at the moment, actually, a lot of these images are part of an exhibition, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But you can really see a real dramatic shift. And I was kind of looking at images of, um, there were like tanks and wars and conflict. And I, my first thought was, wow, adults really suck, like this is kind of what we're feeding <laughs> children. But then my next thought was, is this pessimistic and sad or is it actually really pragmatic that kids are already thinking about these issues critically? Yeah, that's right. So the first question I give back is, um, is it because they are getting more information? Are, are we showing them more of this stuff? Or is it also because they become more curious about mm. it? or their, is their perception is enhanced to be more uh, exposed and, and, uh, and absorbent of all this uh, amount of information? Um, that's a question that we still need to answer. Um, but not all is bad. I think we have to, and children, I think they need to, and they want to learn about the whole spectrum of what happens uh, in the world. And sometimes we think that we just need to show the positive side. Mm. Well, they're not getting it only. 
they are getting it from somewhere else, as we can see. So, so where is the conversation again, right? Yeah. So these are really deep ideas that perhaps form our expectations and understandings of the leaders of the future or how they will see leadership as they mm. are adults. So shouldn't we at least be having conversations about it? And yeah, also absolutely. listening to what they want and then how can we um, collaborate with them as the current generation to to make a shift there, right? Yeah. All right. And the, in late primary school, the children uh, stop being so uh, immersed into the entertainment and 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 celebrities and all, but they become really interested in the humanitarian side and specifically in the politics of leadership. And they're really critical. They are sometimes um, skeptical or cri and also negative. And sometimes it's just funny because they just maybe don't know. Uh, this is something to research as well, but you know, they, they, they have to sort of have that conversation to process what's funny about it and why are they, um, what are they really wanting to say? Mm -hmm. So there was an example of one of the drawings we collected this year, because this was all in 2018, which I measured and interviewed and coded and analyzed. But we this year we are running an exhibition where there are drawings from children from 2022. And there was, um, it was like the SpongeBob, uh, drawing of a leader and then you say oh it's spongebob and he's being funny you know and i'm like okay but when you start to look at it it's full of like potatoes are around it and then it's like um spongebob and potato end up ending hunger in the world so there's so what's the language and that can start a great conversation with a with a child about what they're hoping and what where they want to go. It's actually really interesting because I think the humor aspect is maybe part of our our nature. We like to laugh about things to process them, and I actually think humor is a really great way to subvert really traditional para like paradigms of leadership. So you know, you think of a leader like very storm and kind of intimidating, mm. but a joke can kind of put you know people at ease and it opens things up. So I actually think that's something kind of quite cool about yeah, kids thinking about that. Yeah, and it's actually something that they look in a leader. So uh, when we ask them what is a good leader, um, being funny was a major one. So besides telling, being, you know, knowledgeable and, <laughs> and, and kind and helpful, but being funny is important, very important. Yeah, it's always... And I think we should probably listen to, <laughs> to <laughs> yeah, that. I think so too. <laughs> All right. So, what shapes children's understanding of leaders? Um, well, their close environments, the culture and the context that they live in, uh, but also their experience and exposure to, to to leaders. So, if you have children at home, and it's it's a good thing to have a conversation about leaders, and maybe you all pull out a piece of paper and draw your own leader, and then you start to talk, and then and then they start to recognize that leaders come from different contexts, and then you can talk about what are the values and what are they here for, and if they are interested in doing it, or you know, so. These are conversations that are, they really enjoy, engage with, and they want to have. Mm -hmm. So do that for dinner later today. <laughs> <laughs> um, what can shape children's understanding of leaders? So from the research, we have seen uh, studies where religious teaching, for example, has shifted or shaped children's understanding of leaders. In the Philippines, they did a study in Catholic schools and uh, the majority of children drew Jesus. So uh, quite different from here where we only had two children uh, making an, a religious um, depiction of a leader. 
history teaching uh, has been found more in the U.S., where you um, many children, especially in grade three, four, five, six, uh, draw Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela. We did have one one girl here draw Nelson Mandela, but I think we need to think about how the history teaching mm. and leaders. Um, that seems particularly relevant when we saw only one depiction of a First Nations leader mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's not that you teach and they will absorb. Like mm. I said, it's got to be something that really goes into you when you really have an experience with a leader, but this will obviously expand their understanding and make them curious and perhaps... Um, more, yeah, more knowledgeable of the different kinds of leaders that there are. And policies and programs, uh, in, again, in the U.S., they have found that, well, if there's more representation of female leaders in different industries or um, levels of the government, then the girls is, uh, minimize their tendency to draw male leaders. And these... I believe can be very well connected to the fact that they they'll be capable of pursu pursuing leadership positions later on, mm -hmm. like they'll feel com feel confident or they have it in their uh, mind that the, it is an option. Um, but what is really shaping it at the moment here, where I did the research, it's basically mm, media in the older ones. Um, so. For those that were was not like a direct reference, it it's all coming from media, and I guess the last note for me to conclude is, in a time of misinformation, false information, post truth, do we just let it leave it like that, or do we really start having these conversations, and and it really um, start. <laughs> yeah, it sounds it sounds like there's some urgency to start having critical conversations like this with young people. And, you know, you've touched on gender a few times. And I think um, before we go to the Q&A, so everybody put your comments in the um, – your questions in the comments. But I want to kind of reflect on, you know, the time that we're living in. There is an increased focus in mainstream, mainstream media around representation of women in particular. Um, and there's more scrutiny and expectation that we're going to see more female leaders, and and not just female leaders, but lead leaders from across the spectrum of our communities as well. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what were your kind of key observations that indicated that maybe um, there's a real kind of gender leadership idea present for young people already? Yeah, well, the fact, um, as I said, that the boys usually draw boys and girls mm, less, that already gives us a bit of a difference of what, how gender um, is perceived and, and the opportunities. And the, I guess the think leader, think male bias is still very, very much there in the youngest children mm. now happening today. So that's an important one. As you say, um, Gender across the spectrum, um, so no, no representation of that. However, in the collection of drawings we did this year, um, we asked the older children to draw the leader of the future, and there were some uh, references to uh, diverse uh, recognitions of gender, mm. and that was really interesting to see. I think that says something. You know, it says that representation does matter. Mm. You know, I think it's um, really interesting to hear about Young people don't just absorb something and then that's the leader that they imagine. They think critically about it, they process it. So if there is more representation of, you know, intersectional leadership, children have another thing to reference and understand and think about. And I think that, that says so much about what where we need to focus our attention. That's right. As a community. And, and then that connects to the differences between boys and girls in terms of what they look in for in leaders. So yes, there's a big difference. Uh, in the oldest ones of what a male leader is or a female leader is. But not always. Um, 
when you look at the PrEP children, for example, uh, they have very similar role models and the characteristics of a leader are very similar. As they start to grow, then you, the language that they use to describe the characteristics of the leader, putting aside their role, the social role, um, but just is it kind, does it need to know uh, where to go, or um, is it helpful to others, or listens to what others have to say, the, uh, respects the mm. other person's ideas. All these things are very similar. But the language um, that they use um, can start to show differentiation between boys and girls. For example, terms like cute mm. or think, or other terms like fast or strong or things like that. But, but the differences are just those, you know? And, and in adult studies, we see a lot of differentiation because if the, the leaders, the female leaders are doing things very different from the male leaders. But I guess my question is, is that because we, we shape that to be as mm -hmm. that? Or is that because there is really, really that distinction between one and the other? When I think what I found is, and it, I know it's controversial, is that it's very similar. And mm -hmm. the differences are really, really low, low percentages. So yeah. we are thinking pretty much in the same way and looking for the same sort of uh, characteristics in the leader. And we also expect those characteristics to come from male or women when we're children. I think that's really exciting, actually, yeah. <laughs> because it's, it tells us that kind of the foundations of having kind of equity mm -hmm. is actually there. It's built into us and then we just kind of stuff it up a bit yeah, later basically, down the line. Don't that's we? right. So that's right. So uh, the work wouldn't be so intense because we just, it's there. We just mm. need to cherish it and tell them <laughs> that whatever they're seeing out there doesn't need to be how they things need to turn up to, t will turn up to be. Like they're w they can keep shaping it however they want. Um, we touched on earlier around the role of families and, and parents and, and things like that. Can you talk a little bit more about um, how children spoke about their mums as leaders? Because I think that's a really important conversation to have too. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, mums are obviously there and they are grand and they are important, uh, especially for the youngest children. But every relationship with a mom is different for every child. So you can see um, the mom where she was drawn and, and, and the girl was talking about their hairs and how they both had the same hairs and she would, you know, do the, put some pins and they use the same kinds of pins. And so it was about that that similarity of her to, towards her mom and her mom taking care of her. Uh, but for example, I had another one where the mom was telling off their children that if they didn't clean up the, the cat's uh, <laughs> mess, then the cat would be given away. So uh, it depends really on, on how the, their relationship is and, and what's going on probably at their homes at the moment. But yeah, moms are really, moms and dads are really important, and especially for the younger kids. Uh, in terms of that importance, do you think maybe some of the more, um, that the way that the gender plays out, it does also start at maybe some of the perceptions of home life as well? I think it depends on the parents yeah. and, and how they connect that g gender, differentiation at home with their children. Um, so I guess if if you talk to your daughter as um, in that gender field way as a girl and, and all these things, then that's the way it's gonna go. But if the family is more trying to keep an equal, and I guess communication between their son and the girl and, and sort of treat them like, they're both children and not so much this is the girl mm. this is the boy and this is how you treat you and this is but obviously they'll treat each other differently but not given by the agenda that's really important because 
that will open up op opportunities and, and connections in their brains to what they can and can't do and who they really are and how they shape their own self um, towards the towards others. So yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, kind of following that thread, you know, how should we be talking about leadership with girls? Yeah, I think, um, well, we need to explain that what they're seeing out there is not what needs to happen, mm. that um, things have gone this way so far, but it's not really showing that opportunities need to move like that, um, that anyone can really do what they want to do. And, and I think we just need to be really upfront. And, and I think that that finding of the faceless woman is really great because it's like their face could, could be that face. It's like, it's not there yet, but it will be some of someone from your generation, right? So, mm. so yeah, so don't, the conversation is not that complex. It's, it, we just need to have it because they are already telling us that they want it, but they don't see it. So. I think it's quite hopeful mm. um, than, you know, back in the 80s when just it, it just didn't, didn't exist. Don't so, go there. Yeah. So it, we've made an advancement and I think, but if we act and, and communicate now, I think we'll save years and generations of like, okay, now let's move a <laughs> little bit more. Okay, 20 years more and then it, we're in, you know, it's more like. So, and I think maybe the, the conversations we're having about addressing leadership is still with adults. You know, we're still talking, we're trying to transform our organisations mm -hmm. to be more equitable. We're trying to talk about politics and changing representation. But we're not talking to children at all and we're not getting their input because mm -hmm. they actually have this really clear perspective that it's kind of been unfettered by um, kind of maybe some of the cynical parts of being a grown-up. Mm -hmm. um, so they could actually be really helpful, I think, in that's, us resetting. That's, that's exactly right. So I think that's basically what we need to do is work with them. But the first step was finding out what they thought because we didn't even know. Mm. So now we have an idea and then so now we can go into the next stage, which is how we work with them. And I think part of it and the, this conversation, the exhibition that we have on at Reservoir West Primary School until Sunday, um, we're opening from 10 to 12 on Saturday and Sunday, and it will be the last day on Sunday. It's a really, uh, I'm gonna put it on. It's a really great uh, way to also keep the conversation going and, and get to your own reflections. Like I try to talk and explain, and but you will also find out just by being immersed in nearly ten, uh, a thousand drawings of leaders, how it progresses and how and where are these ideas coming from, and what uh, and it makes us reflect. What do we want to do? What are we going to do? Yeah, I think the um, I went to see the exhibition and it is amazing. It's actually really overwhelming too because there's so much and you want to spend time with each um, illustration as well. Um, I'm actually really interested in the process of doing the work in the schools and I think, you know, we might have some educators and teachers listening in. Um, how did you kind of see the children enacting some of their ideas of leadership while you're doing the project when you're in a classroom environment? Did you see that kind of play out during that process? Enacting like being leaders, yeah. Or um, I saw it more in the exhibition because we have a leader box and they were really taking ownership of that. All the adults were like, I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's a, something I would like to do. So, because the activity was drawing, it was pretty much them uh, having a reflection and, and placing their ideas in, on, in a drawing and they were really focused on that. But I think now that we have asked, I would like to share this knowledge with them. And a great way to do that is, as you say, enacting a role play and getting them to 
lived some of these drawings uh, through workshops so that they can expand their minds about what leadership is and what it can be. Yeah, I think the role play thing is really interesting. Mm. And in one of our earlier conversations, we were talking about theatre making because that is something that is part of you as well. And how important it is to be performative, um, to actually like play a role and see if it suits you. Mm -hmm. um, do, you th do you think there's a place for artistic expression in some of these conversations and how we have them with kids? So important. It's so important. Like I can't see any other way. You can't s approach a child and, and give them a questionnaire or like just you know, go with an interview and they don't know you. Art, they are artists and, and they live in that sort of state of... Uh, perception and expression and art is the way it's the way to find out uh, what they think but also it's the way to for them to get these ideas in and and really you know uh, make those connections in in their brains about what leadership is so yeah I, I definitely imagine and look um, for those ideas that they've always explained in their drawings, uh, one that comes to mind is a girl who saw another girl at the zoo who was lost, and there was a zookeeper trying to help her and finding her mom, um, and that was the leader, because it was a, an, a deep experience, mm -hmm. and, and she lived it, and that's how she understood that it's someone that helps, that... Uh, is going to connect again the girl to her mom and 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 you know and no one else will and and this is the moment of leadership and that that was really important for her as her she conceives those ideas of leadership in her mind yeah but i mean that's also something that you don't have to be in a formal education setting to do either you know i think you can do that at home in your families as well like maybe at dinner, who's going to lead the conversation, who's the discussion mm. topic tonight, you know, give people different roles to try those things on a little bit. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, and we don't even need to name it. Yeah. Like, I think um, at home, I got in trouble once because um, I was with friends and they asked uh, Luna, my daughter, who is the leader in your house? And she's like, well, sometimes it's mom, sometimes it's dad, sometimes it's me, and then... Uh, the mom was like, no, the leader is um, the mom and the dad. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, not always, because that's the best safe place to to give them opportunities to be leaders, to also make decisions and and experience that. And we, as parents, can empo empo empower this. And I think it's such a good starting point. I think um, it's also touching on something... Um, that I think should be acknowledged and that we often think leadership's quite structural, you know, particularly, at, you know, corporate world, it's the CEO, it's the politician, you know. Mm. But I think um, something that we've been talking a lot uh, about at Footscray Community Arts and also other settings I'm involved with is that leadership doesn't have to be structural. It, 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 anybody can be a leader and actually kind of decoupling that title and that formal role to the really positive attributes of leadership is mm -hmm. really exciting and I think needed. Um, yeah. 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 When you say that, it reminds me when I was, I didn't know anything about how to explore these concepts in children's minds. And I was thinking, I'm going to study leadership. So I'm going to go and observe children playing in the playground. And then, yeah. And that's what they used to do like 40 years ago. So <laughs> um, you have to go and ask them, but yeah, so now I know a lot. <laughs> but what I, what I mean is when you actually look at children playing in, in the playground, then there's always the leadership is floating around. So one of them is really good at climbing in the monkey bar. So that's the moment where they lead the others and teach them. And, you know, the, the others ones are following, but then there's another one who's an expert runner, and so then they're playing tag, and that's that's the leader. So when we look at our teams as grown-ups, and, yeah, it's not about that person. It's a social resource, and 
and in teams, it can really be organic and shift from one person into another because we all have different skills. And, and I think also being the leader all the time, like one of the drawings said, can be really tough. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and it's so relevant after two years of COVID and navigating that. We are seeing our leaders burn out as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we've also got to create safety around leadership. Um, something we spoke about in one of our conversations was about um, the idea that, you know, leaders are put on this pedestal and they have to make all these decisions, but actually we can't kind of support communities unless those people are supported as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that's interesting thinking about the playground and who gets to be the leader today. It kind of moves around and the idea of collectivising leadership is really interesting as well. Yeah, and it happens a lot in childhood games and I think that's something to learn from them because um, then you sort of let it go, don't think about it much anymore and then complain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, yeah, we're... Yeah, so how can we feel more proud about leadership and the role that it plays in our society? And how can we share those reflections with the children? We are not going to tell them mm. what needs to happen. They're pretty good at knowing where they want to go. Um, but it's a collaboration. It's got to be a collaboration of what they experience um, has and they're unbiased and uh, highly perceptive notions of the world. Yep. I think that's a really powerful note to kind of close this conversation. Um, do you have any final reflections? So, Jordan, what do you want to leave the people listening with, with from today? Mm. Well, I want to look, for me, the most important thing is to hear from you all, <laughs> to, yeah, to just get in touch, have a conversation, and, and, and move this into the next level. So the research has been done. We have found all these that we've been discussing. But what needs to happen now needs to happen collectively. And so, yeah, get in touch and let's start uh, discussing the next stage of this incredible topic and get it down to... Get the it moving. Yeah. <laughs> let's start shaping a future of yeah. leaders that we're really excited about. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah, great. Um, Claudia's email, I think, is on the slides um, if you want to get in touch. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for joining us at the Wheeler Centre. Um, and just my reflection is that, you know, children are already thinking and engaging with concepts of leadership, not just in play. You know, they're, they're thinking about it really critically and that's a, a social resource. I love that word, um, love that phrase, that we should also be harnessing and thinking about critically as adults as well. So thank you so much, Claudia. It's really been a pleasure. Um, and thanks to the Wheeler Centre so much for having us too. Yes, thank you, Robin. It's been great. I hope you all enjoyed. Thank you to the Wheeler Center. Special thanks to Alice Glenn. And until next time.